Hello and welcome to the EduTalk series hosted by Biotone and Biotone Edu Partner Program and Massage Industry Experts. With the challenges that continue to face massage schools, students, and practicing therapists thanks to COVID and now the Delta variant, the EduTalk series by Biotone continues to support virtual learning and building massage community by connecting you with industry experts who share their knowledge and expertise on topics not only for class discussion, but career success. Tonight's expert is Geraldine Villeneuve, a licensed massage therapist with 40 years experience. She's an American board certified reflexologist and a member of the International Council of Reflexologists and recipient of the 2019 Significant Contribution Awards. Most recently, Geraldine presented at the 2021 World Reflexology Conference and she's the author of Put Your Best Feet Forward. Let's listen and learn as Geraldine unravels foot pain using structural reflexology. Feet are a microcosm of the body and Geraldine will reveal how to recognize body imbalances and how to assess foot alignment structure, muscle and joint tension using easy and effective reflexology, massage and gentle traction techniques to return your feet to comfort and function while relieving symptoms in other parts of the body. Hello, Geraldine, and welcome to the EduTalks tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, and Alan, for inviting me here to speak to uh, the group. And also, I want to thank Biotone for holding these EduTalks series. Um, classes and I'm honored to be here to share what I know. So we'll get started and I'll begin by sharing the screen. Um, all right. Oh, I guess I have to share first. I'm sorry, I'm new at this. <laughs> share screen and then I'm going to go here. Um, play from start. Which nope. screen do you want Oops. to share? I want to share this one, this one right here. Is it? Oops. This one. Oh boy. I'm so sorry. I had this all planned out. This one? This one. And how do I go back? Share. All right. Thank goodness my husband Neil's here to help. Um, okay. So um, as I mentioned, I'm just going to um hide self. You, whoops, I, I really don't. I just really um, wanted to need the screen here. How do I get out of this? Right here. There. Okay. Okay. I'm back. So, hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today. Um, we probably will be on this journey together for about a half hour to 45 minutes. I have a video in the end to share with you uh, about the techniques that you just these two techniques will take you a long way in your practice. Um, so we'll begin here. And we've already been, um, I've already been introduced about the awards that I've received um, for research um, with, this, with this structural reflexology. And uh, these are award-winning techniques, which I have been um, given also from the Reflexology Association of America, I received this year, Excellence in Education. I do have videos and live courses that are approved for continuing education, both by the ARCB and the National Certification Board for Therapeutic Massage and Body Work. So, learning objectives. I'm from Vermont. And I wish it was nice and sunny like it shows with this cow, but it's been raining here and it's cool. Um, so to, to let you know what we're up to, I will be defining reflexology, structural reflexology rather. I'll demonstrate, demonstrate how uh, reflexology relates to foot function. 
outline the basic structure of function of feet, understand how to assess feet reflexively and locally, understand the impact certain shoes have on feet and body mechanics. I will be demonstrating how to release muscle and joint tension causing foot problems. And of course, I like to have fun while we learn. So it's a special gift to be able to help someone relieve stress through the healing power that flows from our thumbs and fingers. I'm sure all of you have a special story to tell about your therapeutic practice that speaks to this. For now, I will share how I discovered structural reflexology and how this method has provided the answer to many unresolved problems, both in the feet and body. After practicing reflexology for 12 years and before the internet age, national and international reflexology forums began to emerge. I was ecstatic about this and took these opportunities as you are now to deepen my reflexology awareness and improve my practice. At one delightful reflexology conference in 1995, which was held in St. Louis, Missouri, I was deeply moved by one of the presenters who delivered uh, information about foot mechanics. His name is Dr. Uh, Mr. Bill Runquist. Um, let me see if I can get, there it is, my little pointer. So this, I'll get in just a moment here. Laser pointer, there it is. So this is uh, Bill Runquist, and um, I apprenticed with him for about four years um, after I heard him speak at this conference. And he educated the audience about foot mechanics, the damage certain shoes cause to feet and why. And he relayed this information from uh, information he learned from chiropodist Dr. Simon Wickler, he, who was the designer of the Buster Brown shoe, and from orthopedic specialist, Dr. John Martin Hiss. Although each of these mentors of mine have passed, I continue to learn and build on their message and have developed my own techniques and philosophy of why foot mechanics and reflexology have a direct relationship with each other. And thus, structural reflexology was born. So what is structural reflexology? Uh, structural reflexology is the practice of integrating foot reflexology with anatomy, physiology, and kinesiology by using local and reflexive methods to release stress and compensation in the entire body. Structural reflexology addresses tension sites on feet as the product of local muscle and ligament strain while maintaining an understanding of how these sites of tension on the feet will impact the rest of the body. The areas outlined in red here are muscle attachment sites. And this is a, a reflexology map that I created um, with these areas circled in red, which are all muscle attachments originating from the lower leg, mostly. So benefits of structural reflexology are relieves foot pain, uh, foot and body pain, improves foot joint articulation, improves weight bearing and balance, improves blood and nerve supply to the feet and body, improves posture, and improves overall body strength and vitality. The evolution of my structural reflexology practice developed gradually over the last 28 years. And one landmark is when I realized the guidelines I learned in my reflexology training were not only helpful in orienting me to the feet as a microcosm of the body, but each guideline also defined very important parts of the skeletal structure of the foot. For instance, the diaphragm line here uh, is also associated with the articulation of the metatarsals and phalangeal joints. These are the most, the areas of most articulation in the foot. The waistline is uh, considered the area of the transverse colon and is the division line of the mid body, but it's also an articulation point 
um, where the tarsals meet the metatarsals here, which is a, a very important point of articulation in, with joints. And the pelvic line is the region between the talus and the calcaneus. This is the, the plantar view of the foot. Any one of these areas, if it becomes locked, it will affect areas in the body. Uh, and so this is just a, a, an initiation to where we're headed with this. So the medial arch of the foot has always fascinated me. As a reflexologist, I understood the arch of the foot as a reflex area for the spine of the body. But what was most intriguing to me in my practice is how each individual person had a similar shape in the arch of their foot as their spine. So if they had a high arch, they would have a, a larger lordotic curve. If they had a short, a, more of a shorter arch, their curves would be less uh, obvious. So their, their spine and foot matched each other. And I would look at the profile of these of feet and body and just be in awe with it. I thought that's just so amazing. So gradually after studying different theories of how reflexology works, the integration between reflexology and foot function began taking form in my mind. And I honed my practice into working within the zones of the feet, uh, which you see here. Um, and I'm not sure how many of you are reflexologists, but uh, the zone theory is, a, is the way most reflexologists work, at least in the United States, and I know in other countries. Um, and so the, the foot's divided into 10 zones divided by each toe, and it's a three-dimensional cut, if you can imagine, all the way up to the top of the head. So as you're working these zones, you're creating a clarity of energy, a pathway of clarity, um, as you are using specific reflexing techniques. And, and you will start to feel different raised textures as you're thumb walking, as we call it in reflexology, up these zones. Um, so that's one theory, is working through zones to create um, a clarity of energy to relax the nervous system is mostly uh, part of it. Actually, it's quite a large part of it. Um, I also uh, work within the nervous system, as I just mentioned, because of the brain's sensory connection with the feet and hands. In her study on reflex activity, Dr. Mary Tuchierer, who is a chiropractor, discovered that the feet and hands take up more space in the brain than any other part of the body. Um, this was a study that she did, did and presented at, a, inter, at an international conference in British Columbia in, in Vancouver um, years back in the 90s. So this is another theory how it works. This is my image of when she said this, this is what came to mind. So this is the spinal cord, the brain, and the feet and hands. So if you have trouble with your feet and hands, they're taking up a, a lot of space in your brain, stress. And so we want to relax the feet. We want to relax the hands so the brain can also get a break. And the next theory is mine, which is efficient foot function. So... The feet carry the body through space and efficient and full function of the foot allows the body to move with greater ease. Any part of the foot that is compromised in function will be reflected in the body above. For example, a flexible foot is directly proportionate to a flexible spine. If feet break down, so will the body. Most people take feet for granted. Body workers touch feet the most and therefore I wanna help this group understand why feet on a large scale are in charge of your bodies. So this image shows uh, gravi gravity, how the body stands in gravity. This is a gravitational line. So when we are standing within this line, uh, we align from the ear to the shoulder, the hip, the knee, and the ankle. And in this position, Standing and posture is effortless. You don't have to try, movement becomes easy. But once things start to go astray in the feet, everything moves away from the gravitational line and certain parts of our body will have to, uh, will start to feel heavy as we move away from, this, from gravity and will try to recover 
And this is when we start to create other issues in other parts of the body. So I'm sure uh, most of you, if not all of you are very familiar with the foot and the bones, but let's go over them anyway. Um, there are 26 plus or minus bones in the foot. When I say plus or minus, I'm talking about additional sesamoid bones that can be embedded in tendons anywhere there's a joint. So there's the calcaneus. This is the dorsal side of the foot, the talus and cuboid, the navicular, the three cuneiforms, five metatarsals, and 14 phalanges. There are 107 ligaments in each foot that hold these bones together to provide a foundational balance for the body and to aid the foot in adapting to different terrain. So this just shows you, um, with permission, I actually purchased this through, <laughs> whoops, let me go back, uh, uh, through Adobe Stock Art. But anyway, I, I do teach ligaments, but I, I'm only covering a, a certain amount, and I'm certainly not going to cover that in this, this uh, presentation, but it's certainly very interesting, and I've narrowed it down to about, about three very problematic ligaments, and I will tell you that's the deltoid ligament and the a ATFL and the CFL. Um, so there's, there's reasons for that, too, and I cover that in some of my advanced classes. So the bones of the feet and the ligaments that knit them together maintain balance for the body and are perfectly designed to do so. So ligaments maintain foot structure. Muscles move the foot. So muscles, if muscles become weak, it's not going to weaken the structure of the foot. The muscles will just be weak. If the ligaments become weak, then the structure changes. Um, but ligaments are very, very strong and they have incredible strength, endurance, and stamina to be able to carry one's body weight. In fact, the ligament structure of the foot can withstand 7,860 pounds of weight per square inch. They're re incredibly strong. Everyone's trying to protect the feet, but they're really, really resilient. So moving on, I want to give you a little idea about the foot again, now that we've got covered the bones. Um, it's made up of two separate columns of bones, and each of, of these columns has a separate function. The lateral column here in blue is the calcaneus, cuboid, and fourth and fifth metatarsals, fourth and fifth phalanges, um, are responsible for bearing the weight of the body and stabilizing body weight and as the muscles that are attached to the foot maneuver and propel. So this is the only area on the foot that bears weight. The medial column in pink consists of the talus, the navicular, the medial intermediate lateral cuneiforms, the first three uh, metatarsals, and the first three groups of phalanges. This side of the foot, the function is to shock absorb and springboard body weight. This column is also considered the medial longitudinal arch and the area of the foot which influences spinal movement. A third arch consists of the cuboid and the cuneiforms. Um, this group of bones makes up the transverse arch. And that transverse arch is what connects um, the two columns of bones together and acts as a bridge to enable weight to be distributed along the foot. So there's three main arches of the foot that are need to keep uh, successful uh, integrity in order for locomotion and standing to be effortless and successful. So the act of walking is not something we normally have to think about, but when joints of the foot start to buckle, the muscles meant to move the foot struggle to perform and uh, to struggle to perform their levering action. 
and begin to cramp from fatigue. In fact, cramping is one of the first signs one is developing a foot problem. In order to avoid pain, our posture changes as we start to recruit other parts of the body to assist the foot in moving and stabilizing the body. Holding and balancing the weight of the body on one foot is an extraordinary miracle. It reminds me of a bumblebee flying with such a big body and small wings because the feet only weigh 2% of your total body weight, yet they're carrying 98% of the, of the load. In order to balance the body on one foot, all the bones, the foot bones and their joints need freedom to articulate and adapt to the foundation we walk, we walk on. The original concept of these six stages of foot placement in one step uh, was originated uh, by Dr. John Martin Hiss. He's an or the orthopedic surgeon. But this image here was made by my husband, Neil's foot. He assisted me in testing the pathway of weight along the foot in one step. And this test validates Dr. Hiss's notion of weight transfer. The outlined area indicate the moment weight is placed on the ground as the foot carries the body along the lateral column. When weight reaches the third stage here, muscles which attach to the transverse arch start to direct weight medially and toward the toes. Strong ligaments and muscles that connect to the transverse arch and medial arch allow foot, the foot to absorb the weight of the body and spring the foot into propulsion. The success of weight transfer and proper weight distribution depends on the stability and position of the cuboid bone. I, I didn't draw a cuboid bone in here, but I think the star will, will suffice. Um, these six stages of weight bearing that I just showed you have become my template to assess feet for foot problems and reflexively also aids my ability to read how the body compensates for foot weakness. So the cuboids considered the keystone because all your weight balances right here, it, it, right when your foot reaches the third stage. And if this bone is properly placed, and there is no joint tension, then the path of weight can continue along the toes. But if weight does not, if there's a, a locked joint somewhere, which is very popular between the cuboid and the fourth and fifth uh, metatarsals um, at the bases, then foot, uh, the foot cannot carry the weight of the body appropriately. And um, then I know there's a foot problem. One side, foot, uh, one side foot mechanics are becoming challenged is when a callus appears or develops on a specific area of the foot. A popular location for callusing develops at the area beneath the small toe. Reflexologists relate this calloused area to shoulder issues, and these findings are usually validated by clients. Structural reflexologists agree with this microcosmic interpretation, but also integrate techniques to relieve local stress to improve foot structure and mechanics that may be causing this reflexive reaction and view this callus as a symptom of faulty weight distribution. So this is uh, a muscle that stabilizes the great toe. There's a lot of them, but this is one of the muscles that needs to be released from tension if you're starting to develop a callus here. The purpose for callusing is to protect the underlying structure or the joint from injury. So another popular area of callusing happens right here at the hip reflex, which is, happens to be right where I was telling you, the joint where the cuboid meets the fifth and fourth metatarsals. This also, if it, if it uh, continues, it can affect the either the splenic flexure of the colon or the hepatic flexure of the colon, depending on which foot. Um, so reflex, structural reflexologists would start to reflex. This is a muscle, by the way, which is the, uh, the fibularis brevis muscle. I want to accentuate that muscle attachment sites on the foot overlap with reflexes. 
Even more amazing is that they have a direct relationship with each other. In fact, all the muscles that move the foot originate at the knee or just below, and therefore they should be more aptly named long foot muscles in order to recognize their very important function of moving the foot. The capacity for these long foot muscles to move the foot has a huge impact on the vitality of the body. When foot mechanics divert from the normal path of weight bearing, those six stages, reflex sites become more palpable because muscles which overlap these reflex sites become either overly strained from imbalanced movement or atrophy due to inactivity. So I'm gonna show you, so this is an example of overlapping. This is the flexor hallucis longus attachment site. And I'm not going to go into detail about this, but when you're touching your feet um, and you're feeling these palpable areas, you're probably touching a muscle that is uh, become stressed or, or strained for one reason or another. There's the hallucis brevis, the adductor hallucis. The tibialis anterior is a very popular site on the arch that people probably feel in their massage therapy practice. So this just goes to show that there's more going on in the feet than you can really imagine. So back to that first example of the flexor hallucis, this longest muscle. This is also considered to be a tendon that divides one zone from the other, zone one from zone two. So flexor hallucis longus overlaps with the pituitary reflex. It is more effective to reflex the entire muscle, this is the posterior leg, um, to release tension at this site. Uh, if someone you're reflexing here or you're massaging here and they go, oh, that's so painful. It's probably pulling this joint very tightly together because this muscle where it's pulling, the fibers of the muscle are pulling this tightness and, and making that joint lock up. So we want to reflex the entire or massage the entire muscle to release tension happening here. The same is true for all long foot muscles. Another popular area that I just spoke about in the arch of the foot here is the tibialis anterior, which attaches to the medial cuneiform and the base of the first metatarsal. So this is the, the shin splint, the tibialis anterior. So as you're reflexing feet or touching the arch of the foot and you feel something here, we might associate this with some sort of gastrointestinal issue, but in order to release the tension there, we need to reflex the entire muscle to make a difference here. And it really does help with gastrointestinal issues. All right. So let's explore this a little further by taking a closer look at the shoulder reflex um, and the muscles that attach to the joints of the little toe and what happens to the body when uh, the function of the toe muscles become challenged. I've been paying close attention to the biomechanical impact on the rest of the body and have concluded that when the little toe does not contact the floor as we walk, the shoulder will compensate by folding inward toward the chest. I've studied correlations with imprints made on this Harris ink mat, which is what this is. It's one of my assessment tools. Here's an example of an ink print made by a client who came to me for help with chronic back pain. This is the left foot. I drew an overlay of reflexes that would be affected as he bears weight on this foot with, with these dismantled bones. You can see these, this really is, is something. Although this person felt tremendous relief from his session with me, it was a little too late as he was scheduled the following week for a colonectomy. He measured shoes two and a half sizes too small. So you can see these darker areas show where the impacted weight of the body is too much. Ideally, all the cells in this print should all be on the lateral column. The medial column should never be touching the floor. Um, but you can see I've, I've made it a little darker in these areas that would be affected. The sigmoid colon, for instance, the transverse colon, part of the pancreas. And look at the spine here and the bulging discs and the bowing out of uh, the spine here. This was a really big success story, believe it or not. I still see this man. I only worked on him once and he said it changed his life. 
Um, he did, he is now in two and a half sizes, bigger shoe. And he did have that colonectomy, but he's on his way to a healthier lifestyle. So here's uh, an example, eight left footprints showing lack of contact from the small toe. See, they're all missing. I, I came upon this about a couple of years ago. I was like, boy, that's, that's just everyone of these prints, what's happening? Um, and I, I made a, a discovery that it must be affecting their, their neck and their shoulder. Um, because the fifth toe stabilizes the side body while weight is transferred along the toes. And absent a weight of weight on the little toe creates a heavy void for the upper body, it's specifically the shoulder girdle, which will react by folding inward toward the midline of the body to help stabilize the heaviness of itself. And this can become pro problematic as vital nerves and blood supply in the head and neck and arms and the hands that travel through the brachial plexus may become impinged and less efficient. Symptoms such as numbness and tingling in the lateral two fingers of the hand, as well as headaches and shoulder pain become apparent. And to a structural reflexologist, these are all signs of a potential foot problem. All eight of these prints are from individuals who experience numbness and tingling in the fourth and fifth finger on the same side as the foot missing the small toe imprint. Each client was seeking relief from various types of foot pain and none mentioned this numbing condition until I inquired. In my opinion, many surgeries are performed because of symptoms which can be misleading and damaging. So this is one of my missions is to be sure people that are getting surgeries are also, um, confusing me. People that are getting surgeries uh, unnecessarily, it, they could really be a foot problem. So that's one of the things that I do. Got a good helper over here. Um, so many of my try, uh, clients try to convince me they were born with that little toe deformity, and really some are, but very few. And after examining the style and size of the shoes they wear, I offer them the likelihood of the deformity as being shoe related. So all eight of those clients of mine in the previous image were wearing a shoe size from one to two and a half sizes too small, every single one of them. In my opinion, this is how their toe deformity started and why their foot mechanics became challenged. This is not uncommon. According to chiropodist, Dr. Simon Wickler, uh, he determined that 80% of people are wearing shoes too small for their feet. This is a Brannock measuring device. And uh, this is the key knob here that a lot of people, when they get their feet measured, they're only getting it measured from their toe to the heel. And they're not bothering to use this probably because they don't know how. So most people size their feet by their toe to heel length. So all of these feet here are all size seven. This is all, an example of three different feet, all measuring a size seven. So, totally, right. Oh, right, toe from their toe to their heel. Um, so after decades of measuring feet, Dr. Wickler, Wickler concluded most people, in fact, 70% have a longer arch measurement than their toe to heel measurement. So this person measures a size eight. So a size seven would be too small, even though their toe to heel measures a size seven, their arch measures a size eight. And that arch needs to absorb the weight of the body and needs that room to be able to do it successfully. So when one doesn't wear a shoe that, when one wears a shoe that doesn't fit the arch, uh, the foot mechanics will be thrown off and the arch will struggle to absorb weight and create a buckled pressure in this arch. And this is where a lot of foot problems begin. Dr. Wickler also noted that 20% of people measure the same size in their toe to heel length from here to here, size seven. 20% of the population, that's not very much, also measure a size seven. So this is the group of people that can wear the, the manufactured shoe, the average manufactured shoe, because when they make shoes, they usually design the arch size 
is um, to coincide with the toe to heel length. But only 20% of people can wear that size and only 6%, uh, only 10% um, have a short arch. This means that they have a very long great toe. This, even though this measures size seven, their arch measures a six. So they're way off base. Um, and this creates a lot of tension in the metatarsophalangeal joint and is the reason a lot of people will get a rigid hallux. And I'm one of them. My, my hallux, my big toe is not rigid right now because I've been working on it uh, when I discovered this, but I have a short arch. So I'm in the 10th percentile of that group. So here's an example of an, a long arch. So from toe to heel, from the back of the toe to the top of the longest toe, back of the heel to the, the toe, this person measures a 10 and a half from toe to heel. But from the metatarsophalangeal joint, which is what the whole purpose of this ball, this beak, you line it up with the joint and follow the beak and this person measured a 12. So, this person needs to be in a size 12 shoe. And uh, when I first discovered this uh, and I measured this person's feet, uh, he had had chronic back pain all the time. And not all the time, but when it happened, he was laid up for about a week. And uh, often enough that it was really interrupting his, his lifestyle. I measured his feet, of course, and he measures a size 12. And when he changed his shoe size and after you doing some structural reflexology, he has not had any episodes of these chronic back pains um, and can't even imagine putting his foot into a size 10 and a half, even though his toe to heel measures that. Okay. Some shoes um, take tremendous effort and strength to manage. And this flip-flop, even though it looks so innocent, is one of the shoes that cause the most problems with foot mechanics. And it's because toes have to engage to manage the shoe so it doesn't fall off. And I know they try to make shoes say, hey, this flip-flop really doesn't fall off, but it doesn't have anything securing the heel. So this foot has to work really, really, really hard to make sure that shoe doesn't fly off. And you certainly couldn't run down the road in a pair of flip-flops, at least and look decent or, you know, have some, some sense of, of dignity. Um, so that's sort of the telling point is, can you run fast in this shoe down, uh, down the road? And if you can't, then your foot has to hold on to it. And when that happens, you forfeit foot function and the foot can no longer carry the body very well. And you're going to end up over a period of time, and it might take 10 to 15 years before it shows up. Um, so not a good shoe. I don't mind wearing a flip-flop once in a while if I'm going to the mailbox and back, but I have to tell you, I did that one time and I got distracted uh, by uh, something happening with one of my pets and I tried to run really fast to rescue him and I broke my foot because my foot did not, the shoe didn't cooperate with my foot and it fumbled me. This was years ago. But after measuring feet, I'm sometimes challenged by clients who are convinced they're wearing the correct size. And some of you will probably feel that way. Um, even though the measuring device reads differently, this phenomenon is understandable and can be attributed to the brain's ability to adapt to wearing small shoes. Some people think it's normal to have their feet all cinched up. However, once one or more of the 38 joints that comprise the foot become locked, a foot problem arises and the answer indeed lies in their foot measurement. Attitudes soon change after receiving a structural reflexology session as clients feel the benefit of improved mobility when their bare feet are placed on the floor. As proprioception improves, in the feet, the brain will no longer tolerate pressure against renewed vitality, leaving clients to wonder how they are going to put those shoes on and get home. That happens a lot in my practice. It's interesting. So the most common cause, we're almost, we're winding up here, but the most common cause of dislocation in buckled foot joints can be attributed to shoes which are too small and shoe styles that prevent appropriate weight along the foot. 
In conclusion, it would add value to the public if more healthcare professionals incorporated structural reflexology into their practice. The privilege of knowing how to prevent or correct foot deformities and the complications that ensue in the rest of the body is a gift. Your clients will greatly appreciate the relief they receive from receiving structural reflexology and will be very impressed by your knowledge of feet. Knowing how feet function and how certain shoes limit the foot's ability to direct and bear weight appropriately is key to keeping the entire body healthy and vital. This is my cat Buster and he's reflexing my mother's foot. I went to, I was going to reflex my mother's feet, but I came in and Buster took my spot. This is a real, very real. So be good to your feet. Your body will appreciate it. Thank you very much for listening. I um, just want to show you a few things that I have for sale on my website. And now I will also now screen share to my video. Okay, now I apologize for the terrible internet in Vermont, um, but the video will be available for viewers uh, to view on their own uh, wonderful internet system. Uh, Danelle is going to consolidate everything I did today and talked about and the video and get that to you tomorrow so you can view it again and, and go through the whole video. I apologize for that. So. Well, no worries. I mean, technical difficulties happen and, um, you know, we will provide the recording of tonight's EduTalk along with the link to the recording of your video. And, um, and this has been very interesting. So we do hope that, uh, you know, everything will work out for the email tomorrow. Thank you so much. I haven't seen any um, chat questions come in. Um, and everyone understands that it's te uh, there's technical issues. Danelle, yes. I see them on the, on the screen here. Um, uh, from Jose Gonzalez says hello. And... Uh, have a, a great day. I'm glad that Jose has joined us. And April Spinas, um, when working on the left foot, does it affect the right hemisphere of the brain or the left? Well, that's a really good question because when I'm reflexing feet and uh, say I'm working with someone who has paralysis on one side of the body, maybe due to a stroke or an injury, while I'm working the great toe, um, I'm thinking about the network of nerves within the brain. And in that case, it definitely affects the opposite side of the body. But if I'm thinking about the local structure, the bones and the muscles of that particular toe, it would be in alignment with the same side of the body. So um, it crosses when uh, intention is placed on the brain reflexes. So the left great toe would affect the right hemispheres of the brain and opposite for uh, the left to the right. I hope that answers your question. That's a great question. I'm sorry about the screen freeze. Um, and it said I'm muted at one point. That must have been frustrating. Um, thank you for being patient with the technology issues. Thank you so much to all of you who joined me today. I feel uh, very honored that you took this time to listen and learn. And I'm here if you have any questions. Um, I have my website, putyourbestfeetforward.com, but you can also email me. I don't think I put my email there um, with questions, but it is structural reflexology at gmail.com. That's structural reflexology at gmail.com if you have questions. Um, and you're welcome, April. Any other questions? I gave you a lot of information. Um, well, as we wrap up, people still have the opportunity to submit chats. And I, you know, I wanted to thank you and we'll get this information out tomorrow once the um, recording is posted to 
the EduTalk Archive Library on biotone.com. Now, um, I'd like to mention the upcoming EduTalks that we have coming up in August. August 10th with Constant Heart is part one of a two-part series. Utilize color aromatherapy to support holistic wellness. And this was originally scheduled for earlier in July. And we um, had some issues that we needed to reschedule for August. So she will be doing part one and part two in August. And again, RSVP is open tonight for part one, August 10th. August 24th, part two is how to create intentional based healing spaces using conscious colors. On September 14th, looking ahead, we have Felicia Brown, get clients to read book, simple strategies to fill your practice. And September 28th, we have Sandy Fritz and Robin Anderson presenting on ergonomics, body mechanics, and working smart. We have celebrated our one year mark with Edu Talks. Thank you, everyone, for making it wonderful. And all of the Edu Talks over the past year are recorded and posted at biotone.com forward slash edu hyphen talks. Additionally, so many of our presenters on Edu Talks are also authors, and we have launched the Edu Talk author series which you can find on YouTube. And these will be books and textbooks that you are familiar with. And it's an opportunity to listen to the editor, I mean, the author, speak about their inspiration and how it will help your career. Um, one last question I saw here, Geraldine, is do you offer certification on structural reflexology or CEUs? Yes, Jamie, I do. I have, um, I, I had a 300 hour course that I started in Seattle, just training people to practice reflexology. Now I only teach continuing education for bodywork professionals and reflexologists um, with structural reflexology. So there are three levels. I do certify people to practice structural reflexology. It's three levels of training and my DVD course is the first level. Um, I usually don't teach uh, by DVD, but through over the last year and a half, um, it certainly has become very popular. And that DVD, um, uh, well, the live course courses are worth, um, Oh boy, <laughs> There's a, the, the whole course is worth a lot of CEUs live, but the DVD that I have available, which is two hours of training, is 12 CEUs for reflexologists through the ARCB, and it's three hours for the NCBTMB. Um, so yes, it is available for CE credit. It involves uh, testing. You have to take a test to, uh, demonstrate your comprehension of the material, and then I give you a transcript uh, as proof uh, of your participation in the program. But yes, I do offer a certification series. So, um, and it's wonderful. And I do travel around the world normally. <laughs> and, and then any of your um, training will be on your website. Yes, I have blogs and I do announce when I'm teaching live courses. And um, on my shop page, you will see um, putyourbestfeetforward.com uh, shop page is where I have my DVD. Uh, if you're going to get 12 CEUs for ARCB, um, you need to do by the, the two set DVD. But if you're just interested in learning structural reflexology, you don't have to. Um, be tested. You can just do this on your own, and it's also available in VOD. Um, Geraldine, one last question came in from April. What type of reflexology do you re recommend for those with autism? Well, gentle touch um, reflexology, because I have had experience working with autistic children, and they are easily distracted, and they need uh, their nervous systems to be calm. 
Um, and so when you're, when you're working, if you happen to work with uh, someone who, who practices with autism, these are people that won't have very many things in their room to distract. Um, it'll be very calming. So if you can look up gentle touch reflexology, that is the way to go. Um, uh, there are many forms of reflexology. The structural reflexology is um, very physical um, and very gentle at the same time. Um, and I haven't had the opportunity to do structural reflexology, <coughs> excuse me, on an autistic person, but I have had the opportunity to do straight reflexology. And I work a lot with the nervous system itself. It's a good question. Well, thank you. And I don't see any other questions. So it's a great moment to wrap up. And again, um, thank you everyone for attending and joining us and supporting us for through our first year of EduTalks. And um, watch your inbox for not only upcoming invitations for the August and September talks, but also the follow-up information with Geraldine that will be going out um, tomorrow or by Thursday latest. Thank you, everyone. Be safe. Thank you so much. Take care.